the flight. An angel of God took Moses to a distance of 40 days' journey from Egypt, so far off that all fear was banished from his mind. Indeed, his anxiety had never been for his own person, but only on account of the future of Israel. The subjugation of his people had always been an unsolved enigma to him. Why should Israel, he would ask himself, suffer more than all the other nations? But now that he was initiated in the tail-bearing and backbiting that prevailed among the Israelites, he asked himself, does this people deserve to be redeemed? The religious conditions among the children of Israel were such at that time as not to permit them to hope for divine assistance. They refused to give ear to Aaron and the five sons of Zerah, who worked among them as prophets, and admonished them to the fear of the Lord. Pharaoh abused them more and more oppressively until God had mercy on them and sent Moses to deliver them from slavery. After his successful escape from the hands of the hangman, Moses had no idea that a royal throne awaited him. It was nevertheless so. A war broke out at this time between Ethiopia and the nations of the east that had been subject to it until then. Kaikonos, the king, advanced against his enemy with a great army. He left Balaam and Balaam's two sons, Janes and Jambres, behind to keep guard over his capital and take charge of the people remaining at home. The absence of the king gave Balaam the opportunity of winning his subjects over to himself, and he was put on the throne, and his two sons were set over the army as generals. To cut Kaikonos off from his capital, Balaam and his sons fortified the city, so that no one could enter it against their will. On two sides, they made the walls higher. On the third, they dug a network of canals into which they conducted the waters of the river surrounding the whole land of Ethiopia. And on the fourth side, by means of magic arts, collected a large swarm of snakes and scorpions. Thus, no one could depart and no one could enter. Meanwhile, Kaikonos, succeeded in subjugating the rebellious nations. When he returned at the head of his victorious army and saw the high city wall from afar, he and his men said, The inhabitants of the city, seeing that the war detained us abroad for a long time, have raised the walls and fortified them, that the kings of Canaan may not be able to enter. On approaching the city gates, which were barred, they cried out to the guards to open them but by Balaam's instructions they were not permitted to pass. A skirmish ensued in which Kaikonos lost 130 men. The next day the combat continued, the kings with his troops being stationed on the banks of the river. This day he lost 30 riders who, mounted on their steeds, had attempted to swim the stream. Then the king ordered rafts to be constructed for the transporting of his men. When the vessels reached the canals, they were submerged, and the waters, swirling round and round, as though driven by mill wheels, swept away two hundred men, twenty from each raft. On the third day, they set about assaulting the city from the side on which the snakes and scorpions swarmed, but they failed to reach it, and the reptiles killed one hundred and seventy men. The king desisted from attacking the city but for nine years he surrounded it so that no one could come out or go in. While the siege was in progress, Moses appeared in the king's camp on his flight from Pharaoh and at once found favor with Kaikonos and his whole army. He exercised an attraction on all that saw him, for he was slender like a palm tree, his countenance shone as the morning sun, and his strength was equal to a lion's. So deep was the king's affection for him that he appointed him to be the commander-in-chief of his forces. At the end of nine years, Kaikonos fell to a mortal disease, and he died on the seventh day of his illness. His servants embalmed him, buried him opposite the city gate toward the land of Egypt, and over his grave they erected a magnificent structure, strong and high. On the walls they engraved all the mighty deeds and battles of the dead king. Now, after the death of Kaikonos, his men were greatly grieved on account of the war. 
Each said to the other, Counsel us, what shall we do at this time? We have been living in the wilderness away from our homes for nine years. If we fight against the city, many of us will fall dead. And if we remain here besieging it, we shall also die. For now, all the princes of Aram and of the children of the east will hear that our king is dead, and they will attack us suddenly and fight with us until not a remnant will be left. Now, therefore, let us go and set a king over us, and we will remain here besieging the city until it surrenders. They could find no one except Moses fit to be their king. They stripped off each man his upper garment and cast them all in a heap on the ground, making a high place on top of which they sat Moses. Then they blew the trumpets and called out before him, Long live the king! Long live the king! And all the people and the nobles swore to give him Adoniah for wife, the Ethiopian queen, the widow of Kykonos, and they made Moses king over them on that day. They also issued a proclamation, commanding every man to give Moses of what he possessed. And on the high place they spread a sheet on which each one cast something, this one a gold nose ring, that one a coin, onyx stones, bedellum, pearls, gold, silver, and all in great abundance. Moses was twenty-seven years old when he became king over Ethiopia, and he reigned for forty years. On the seventh day of his reign, all the people assembled and came out before him to ask his counsel as to what was to be done with the city they were besieging. Moses answered them and said, If you will hear my words, the city will be delivered into your hands. Proclaim with a loud voice throughout the whole camp, So says the king, Go to the forest and fetch some young storks, each man one in his hand. And if there be any man that transgresses the word of the king, not to bring a bird, he shall die, and the king will take all that belongs to him. And when you have brought them, they shall be in your keeping. You shall raise them until they grow up, and you shall teach them to fly as the hawk flies. All the people did according to the word of Moses, and after the young storks had grown to full size, he ordered them to be starved for three days. On the third day, the king said to them, Let every man put on his armor and gird his sword. Each one shall mount his horse, and each shall set his stork on his hand, and we will rise up and fight against the city from the place of the serpents. When they came to the appointed spot, the king said to them, Let each man send forth his young stork to descend on the serpents. Thus they did and the birds swooped down and devoured all the reptiles and destroyed them. After the serpents were removed in this way, the men fought against the city, subdued it, and killed all its inhabitants. But of Moses' people, not one died. When Balaam saw that the city had fallen into the hands of the besiegers, he exercised his magic arts, which enabled him to fly through the air, and he carried with him his two sons, Janes and Jambres, and his eight brothers, and they all took refuge in Egypt. Seeing that they had been saved by the king, and the city had been taken by his good counsel, the people became more than ever attached to him. They set the royal crown on his head, and gave him Adoniah, the widow of Kykonos, to wife. But Moses feared the stern god of his fathers, and he went not into Adoniah nor did he turn his eyes toward her. For he remembered how Abraham had made his servant, Eliezer, swear to him, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. He also remembered what Isaac did when Jacob fled before his brother Esau, how he commanded his son, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, nor ally yourself by marriage with any of the children of Ham. For the Lord our God gave Ham the son of Noah and all his seed as slave to the children of Shem and Japheth forever. At that time Aram and the children of the east heard that Kykonos, the king of Ethiopia, had died, and they rose up against the Ethiopians. But Moses went with a mighty army to fight against the rebellious nations, and he subdued them, first the children of the east and then Aram.
Moses continued to prosper in his kingdom. He conducted the government in justice, righteousness, and integrity, and his people loved and feared him. In the fortieth year of his reign, while he was sitting on his throne one day, surrounded by all the nobles, Adoniah the queen, who was seated before him, rose up and spoke. What is this thing that you, the people of Ethiopia, have done these many years? Surely you know that during the forty years this man has reigned over you, he has not approached me, nor has he worshipped the gods of Ethiopia. Now therefore, let this man reign over you no more, for he is not of our flesh. Behold, Marcanos, my son, is grown up. Let him reign over you. It is better for you to serve the son of your Lord than a stranger, a slave of the king of Egypt. For a whole day the people and nobles contended with one another, whether or not to pay heed to the words of the queen. The officers of the army remained faithful to Moses, but the people of the cities were in favor of crowning the son of their former lord as king. The following morning they rose up and made Marcanos, the son of Kykanos, king over them. But they were afraid to stretch forth their hand against Moses, for the Lord was with him. They also remembered the oath they had sworn to Moses, and therefore they did him no harm. Moreover, they gave many presents to him, and dismissed him with great honor. When Moses left Ethiopia in the sixty-seventh year of his life, it was the time appointed by God in the days of old to bring Israel forth from the affliction of the children of Ham. But, fearing to return to Egypt on account of Pharaoh, Moses journeyed to Midian. Jethro In the city of Midian, named so for a son of Abraham by Keturah, Hagar, the man Jethro had lived for many years, doing a priest's service before the idols. As time went on, he grew more and more convinced of the vanity of idol worship. His priesthood became repugnant to him, and he resolved to give up his station. He stood before his townsmen and said, Until now I performed your services before the idols, but I have grown too old for the duties of the office. Choose, therefore, whoever you would choose to take my place. Speaking so, he delivered to the people all the paraphernalia appertaining to the idol worship and told them to transfer them to the one in whom their discretion they should entrust his position. Suspecting Jethro's hidden motives, the people put him under the ban, and no one would venture to do him the slightest service. Not even would the shepherds pasture his flocks, and there was nothing for him to do but impose this work on his seven daughters. Jethro's transformation from an idolatrous priest into a God-fearing man is conveyed by his seven names. He was called Jether because the Torah contains an additional section about him. Jethro, he overflowed with good deeds. Hobab, the beloved son of God. Reuel, the friend of God. Heber, the associate of God. Putail, he that has renounced idolatry and Kenai, he that was zealous for God and acquired the Torah. In consequence of the hostile relations between Jethro and the inhabitants of the city, his daughters were in the habit of making their appearance at the watering troughs before the other shepherds came. But the ruse was not successful. The shepherds would drive them away and water their own flocks at the troughs the maidens had filled. When Moses arrived in Midian, it was at the well that he came to a stop, and his experience was the same as Isaac's and Jacob's. Like them, he found his helpmate there. Rebekah had been selected by Eliezer as the wife of Isaac while she was busy drawing water. Jacob had seen Rachel there first while she was watering her sheep, and at this well in Midian, Moses met his future wife, Zipporah. The rudeness of the shepherds reached its climax the very day of Moses' arrival. First they deprived the maidens of the waters they had drawn for themselves, attempted to do violence to them, and then they threw them into the water with intent to kill them. At this moment Moses appeared, dragged the maidens out of the water, and gave the flocks to drink, first Jethro's, then the flocks of the shepherds, though the latter did not deserve his good services. 
True, he did them the service with but little trouble to himself, for he had only to draw a bucketful, and the water flowed so copiously it sufficed for all the herds, and it did not cease to flow until Moses withdrew from the well, the same well at which Jacob had met Rachel, his future wife, and the same well God created at the beginning of the world, the opening of which he made in the twilight of the first Sabbath eve. Jethro's daughters thanked Moses for the assistance he gave them, but Moses warded off their gratitude, saying, Your thanks are due to the Egyptian I killed, on account of whom I had to flee from Egypt. Had it not been for him, I would not be here now. Moses marries Zipporah. One of the seven maidens who Moses saw at the well attracted his notice in particular, on account of her modest demeanor and he made her a proposal of marriage. But Zipporah repulsed him, saying, My father has a tree in his garden with which he tests every man that expresses a desire to marry one of his daughters, and as soon as the suitor touches the tree, he is devoured by it. Moses, where is the tree? Zipporah, it is the rod that the Holy One, blessed be he, created in the twilight of the first Sabbath eve, and gave to Adam. He transmitted it to Enoch, from him it descended to Noah, then to Shem, and Abraham, and Isaac, and finally to Jacob, who brought it with him to Egypt and gave it to his son Joseph. When Joseph died, the Egyptians pillaged his house, and the rod they took as part of their booty, and brought it to Pharaoh's palace. At that time, my father was one of the most prominent of the king's sacred scribes, and as such he had the opportunity of seeing the rod. He felt a great desire to possess it, and he stole it and took it to his house. On this rod the ineffable name is written, and also the ten plagues that God will cause to visit the Egyptians in a future day. For many years it lay in my father's house. One day he was walking in his garden carrying it, and he stuck it in the ground. When he attempted to draw it out again, he found that it had sprouted, and was putting forth blossoms. That is the rod with which he tries any that desire to marry his daughters. He insists that our suitors shall attempt to pull it out of the ground, but as soon as they touch it, it devours them. Having given him this account of her father's rod, Zipporah went home, accompanied by her sisters. Moses followed them. Jethro was not a little amazed to see his daughters return so soon from the watering troughs. As a rule, the chicanery they had to suffer from the shepherds detained them until late. No sooner had he heard their report about the wonder-working Egyptian than he exclaimed, Perhaps he is one of the descendants of Abraham, from whom issues blessing for the whole world. He rebuked his daughters for not having invited the stranger that had done them so valuable a service to come into their house and he ordered them to fetch him, in the hope that he would take one of his daughters to wife. Moses had been standing without all this time, and had allowed Jethro's daughters to describe him as an Egyptian, without protesting and asserting his Hebrew birth. For this, God punished him by causing him to die outside of the promised land. Joseph, who had proclaimed in public that he was a Hebrew, found his last resting place in the land of the Hebrews, and Moses, who apparently had no objection to being considered an Egyptian, had to live and die outside of that land. Zipporah hurried to execute her father's wish, and no sooner had she ushered him in than Moses requested her hand in marriage. Jethro replied, If you can bring me the rod in my garden, I will give her to you. Moses went out, found the sapphire rod that God had bestowed on Adam, when he was driven forth from paradise, uprooted it and carried it to Jethro, who conceived the idea at once that he must be the prophet of Israel concerning whom all the wise men of Egypt had foretold, that he would destroy their land and its inhabitants. As soon as this thought struck him, he seized Moses and threw him into a pit, in the expectation that he would meet his death there. And indeed he would have perished if Zipporah had not devised a stratagem to save his life. She said to her father, Please listen to my counsel. 
You have no wife, but only seven daughters. Do you want my six sisters to preside over your household? If so, I will go out with the sheep. If not, let my sisters tend the flocks, and I shall take care of the house. Her father said, You have spoken well. Your sisters will go with the sheep, and you shall stay in the house and take care of it, and all that belongs to me. Now Zipporah could provide Moses with all sorts of dainties as he lay in the pit. She did this for seven years. At the end of this period, she said to her father, I recollect that once upon a time you cast into yonder pit a man that had fetched your rod from the garden for you. You committed a great wrong in doing so. If it seems well to you, uncover the pit and look into it. If the man is dead, throw his corpse away, lest it fill the house with stench. But should he be alive, then you ought to be convinced that he is one of those who are wholly pious, or else he would have died of hunger. The reply of Jethro was, You have spoken wisely. Do you remember his name? And Zipporah said, I remember he called himself Moses, the son of Amram. Jethro lost no time. He opened the pit and called out, Moses, Moses. Moses replied and said, Here I am. Jethro drew him out of the pit, kissed him, and said, Blessed be God who guarded you for seven years in the pit. I acknowledge that he kills and revives, that you are one of the holy pious, and that through you God will destroy Egypt in time to come, lead his people out of the land, and drown Pharaoh and his whole army in the sea. Then Jethro gave much money to Moses, and he bestowed his daughter Zipporah on him as wife, giving her to him under the condition that the children born of the marriage in Jethro's house should be divided into two equal classes, the one to be Israelites, the other Egyptian. When Zipporah bore him a son, Moses circumcised him and called him Gershom, as a memorial of the wonder God had done for him, for although he had lived in a strange land, the Lord had not refused him aid even there. Zipporah nursed her first child for two years, and in the third year she bore a second son. Remembering his compact with Jethro, Moses realized that his father-in-law would not permit him to circumcise this one too, and he determined to return to Egypt, that he might have the opportunity of bringing up his second son as an Israelite. On the journey there, Satan appeared to him in the guise of a serpent and swallowed Moses down to his extremities. Zipporah knew that the thing had happened because her second son had not been circumcised, and she hurried to make good the omission. As soon as she sprinkled the blood of the circumcision on her husband's feet, a heavenly voice was heard crying out to the serpent, commanding him, Spit him out! And Moses came forth and stood on his feet. Thus Zipporah saved Moses' life twice, first from the pit and then from the serpent. When Moses arrived in Egypt, he was approached by Dathan and Abiram, the leaders of the Israelites, and they spoke, do you come to slay us? Do you intend to do the same with us as you did with the Egyptian? This drove Moses right back to Midian, and there he remained another two years, until God revealed himself at Horeb and said to him, Go and bring my children out of the land of Egypt. A Bloody Remedy The latter years of Israel's bondage in Egypt were the worst. To punish Pharaoh for his cruelty toward the children of Israel, God afflicted him with a plague of leprosy, which covered his whole body, from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Instead of being softened by his disease, Pharaoh remained stiff-necked, and he tried to restore his health by murdering Israelite children. He took counsel with his three advisors, Balaam, Jethro, and Job, how he might be healed of the awful malady that had seized him. Balaam spoke, You can regain your health only by slaughtering Israelite children and bathe in their blood. Jethro, adverse from having a share in such an atrocity, left the king and fled to Midian. Job, on the other hand, though he also disapproved of Balaam's counsel, kept silence and in no way protested against it. Wherefore, God punished him with a year's suffering. But afterward, 
He loaded him down with all the happiness of this life, and granted him many years, so that this pious Gentile might be rewarded in this world for his good deeds, and not have the right to urge a claim on the good things of the future life. In pursuance of the bloody advice given by Balaam, Pharaoh had his bailiff snatch Israelite babes from their mother's breasts and slaughter them. In the blood of these innocents, he bathed. His disease afflicted him for ten years, and every day an Israelite child was killed for him. It was all in vain. Indeed, at the end of the time, his leprosy changed into boils, and he suffered more than before. While he was in his agony, the report was brought to him that the children of Israel and Goshen were careless and idle in their forced labor. The news aggravated his suffering, and he said, Now that I am sick, they turn and scoff at me. Harness my chariot, and I will take myself to Goshen, and see the derision of the children of Israel show toward me. And they took him, and put him on a horse, for he was not able to mount it himself. When he and his men came to the border between Egypt and Goshen, the king's horse passed into a narrow place. The other horses, running rapidly through the pass, pressed on each other until the king's horse fell, while he sat on it. And when it fell, the chariot turned over on his face, and also the horse lay on him. The king's flesh was torn from him, for this thing was from the Lord. He had heard the cries of his people in their affliction. The king's servants carried him on their shoulders, brought him back to Egypt, and placed him on his bed. He knew that his end had come, and the queen, Alpharanet, and his nobles gathered around his bed, and they wept a great weeping. The princes and his counselors advised the king to choose a successor to reign in his place, whoever he would choose from among his sons. He had three sons and two daughters by the queen Alpharanet, besides children from concubines. The name of his firstborn was Atro, the name of the second Adikam, and of the third Morion. The name of the older daughter was Bithiah, and the other Akuzit. The firstborn of the sons of the king was an idiot, precipitate and heedless in all his actions. Adikam, the second son, was a cunning and clever man versed in all the wisdom of Egypt, but ungainly in appearance, fleshy and very short. His height was a cubit in a space, and his beard flowed down to his ankles. The king resolved that Atticam should reign in his place after his death. When this second son was only ten years old, he had given him Gedida, the daughter of Abelot, to wife, and she bore him four sons. Afterwards, Atticam went and took three other wives and begot eight sons and three daughters. The king's malady increased on him greatly, and his flesh emitted a stench like a carcass cast into the field on a hot summer day. When he saw that his disorder had seized on him with a strong grip, he commanded his son Atticam to be brought to him, and they made him king over the land. At the end of three years, the old king died in shame and disgrace, a loathing to all that saw him and they buried him in the sepulcher of the kings of Egypt, in Zoan. But they did not embalm him, as was usual with kings, for his flesh was putrid, and they could not approach his body on account of the stench, and they buried him in haste. Thus the Lord repaid him with evil, for the evil he had done to Israel. And he died in terror and shame, after having reigned ninety-four years. Atticam was twenty-four years when he succeeded his father, and he reigned four years. The people of Egypt called him Pharaoh, as was their custom with all the kings, but his wise men called him Akuz, for Akuz was the word for shorty in the Egyptian language. Atticam was exceedingly awkward and undersized. The new Pharaoh surpassed his father Malol and all the former kings in wickedness and he made the suffering on the children of Israel even worse. He went to Goshen with his servants and increased their labor. He said to them, Complete your work each day, and let not your hands slacken in the work from this day forward, as you did in the day of my father. He placed officers over them from amongst the children of Israel, and over these officers he placed taskmasters from among his servants. 
and he put before them a measure of bricks, according to the number they were to make day by day, and whenever any deficiency was discovered in the measure, the taskmasters of Pharaoh would go to the women of Israel and take their infants from them, as many as the number of bricks lacking in the measure, and these babes they put into the buildings instead of the missing bricks. The taskmasters forced each man of the Israelites to put his own child in the building. The father would place his son in the wall and cover him over with mortar, all the while weeping, his tears running down on his child. The children of Israel sighed every day on account of their dire suffering, for they had thought that after Pharaoh's death his son would lighten their toil. But the new king was worse than his father, and God saw the burden of the children of Israel and their heavy work and determined to deliver them. However, it was not for their own sake that God resolved on deliverance of Israel, for they were empty of good deeds, and the Lord knew that once they were redeemed, they would rise up against him and even worship the golden calf. Yet he took mercy on them, for he remembered his covenant with the fathers, looked on their repentance for their sins, and accepted their promise to fulfill the word of God after their going forth from Egypt, even before they should hear it. After all, the children of Israel were not wholly without merits. In a high degree, they possessed qualities of extraordinary excellence. There were no incestuous relations among them. They were not evil-tongued. They did not change their names. They clung to the Hebrew language, never giving it up, and great fraternal affection prevailed amongst them. If one happened to finish the quota of his bricks before his neighbors, he was in the habit of helping the others. Therefore God spoke, They deserve that I should have mercy on them, for if a man shows mercy to another, I have mercy on him. Next, the faithful shepherd. End part 40 of 95, thelegendsofthejews.com.